So hello everyone and welcome to our panel session on creating gender inclusive engineering and technology to address climate change. My name is Jeanette Southwood and I am Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Strategic Partnerships at Engineers Canada. I'm also an engineer and I'm Canada's representative on the World Federation of Engineering Organizations Women in Engineering Committee. I have a long history of working on challenges of equity, diversity and inclusion and the challenges of climate change, particularly adaptation and resilience, both before coming to Engineers Canada, where I held national and global roles at an international consulting firm and now at Engineers Canada. Engineers Canada is the national organization of the 12 provincial and territorial engineering regulators that license Canada's more than 300,000 members of the engineering profession. Today, I am joined by Don Bonfield, Royal Academy of Engineering Visiting Professor, Aston University, and also WFEO Women in Engineering Committee Deputy Chair. Yvette Ramos, President of Swiss Engineering Geneva and Consultant to the World Meteorological Organization and also a member of the WFEO Women in Engineering Committee representing Switzerland. Alice Cuna de Silva, nuclear engineer and a member of the COP26 nuclear delivery team, also a member of the WFEO Women in Engineering Committee representing Brazil. And Alba Savre Perez Terran, climate change and innovation officer at Oxfam Belgium and member of the Belgian Consultative Council on Gender and Development. Each of our panelists will be making a presentation after all of the panelists present, I will be directing some questions specifically to them. And then after that, we will have a question and answer period where everyone in the audience will be able to pose questions to our panelists. If you have a question for a specific panelist or for any of the panelists, please go ahead and put those questions into the chat. At COP26 in 2021, the world focused on the climate emergency. It is widely believed that the threat posed by climate change will eclipse everything that any of us have faced to date, and that our collective response will be the defining task of our era. Our speakers today, Dawn, Yvette, Alice, and Alba, will talk about their experience at COP26 and the work that they do to focus on the gender perspective, the implications for engineering and technical solution development, and how this viewpoint must be embedded in strategy and planning. Let's start with Dawn Bonfield. As I mentioned, Dawn is Deputy Chair of the Women in Engineering Committee of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations and was the WFEO Women in Engineering Committee representative at COP26 in November, 2021. Dawn is from the United Kingdom and works both in higher education and as a consultant with her own company and social enterprise. She is Royal Society Entrepreneur in Residence at King's College London working to empower young people in addressing the sustainable development goals as entrepreneurs. She has been Royal Academy of Engineering Visiting Professor of Inclusive Engineering at Aston University since 2017, and is the founder and director of Towards Vision, a not-for-profit which works towards a vision of diversity and inclusion in engineering. She is past president and former chief executive of the Women's Engineering Society, Dawn is founder of the social enterprise Magnificent Women, which celebrates the history of women in engineering, and she was the founder of International Women in Engineering Day, which many of us know as INWET, which takes place on 23rd of June annually. Over to you, Dawn. Thank you very much for that, Jeanette. And <clears throat> Hopefully, I've shared my screen if, if you are able to see that. If yes. someone can nod, great. Perfectly, okay. thank you. So, yeah, so thank you for the introduction and um, for everyone for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm, as Jeanette said, Deputy Chair of the Women in Engineering Committee. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing as a committee um, and what we did at COP26. So, First of all, an introduction to the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. So we are um, an international organization of, and I'm really sorry, I've got my slides over there. I've got a dual presentation and I've worked and I've managed to get it on the other screen, which means though that I've got to look at the other screen. 
forgive me for having to do that, but um, WFEO is, a, is an international organization. It was founded in 1968 under the auspices of UNESCO. And it's a, a, a membership organization of professional engineering institutions. So it's not individual members, but it's institution members. And there are some hundred or so international um, members who represent something like 30 million engineers around the world. So it's a very big and um, influential organization. And the Women in Engineering Committee is one of the committees. And I think there are something like 13 committees. So we, we within the committee have got four themes that we work to. And the first two themes are to do with capacity building. So we know we've got a lack of diversity in engineering. So those two themes look at the pipeline and then the retention and leadership issues. The second, the third theme is to do with strategic indicators. So um, measuring numbers of women in engineering around the world and collecting that data. The fourth one is the one that's relevant to uh, the work that we did at COP26, and that's all around looking at um, goal five, addressing the sustainable development goals. Our committee concentrates on goal five, gender equality, and we look at the way that goal five interacts with the other 17 goals. So we've been doing that work for the last couple of years, really, and we've we, the intention is that we are looking at each goal in turn, and we're assessing how women are disadvantaged according to that particular goal, but crucially what we can all do as engineers and technologists to address that particular disadvantage that women face uh, globally. So we've been creating these uh, banners and this one here, number 13, is the Climate Action Banner, which is obviously the one that we've been concentrating on in the run up to COP26. And, before COP26 last year, we had at the top, you'll see um, two webinars where we were in September and October, we were trying to get our um, story and our messaging across really so that we could take that with us to COP26. And then when we were there, I represented the Women in Engineering Committee, but there were actually a number of our committee there um, representing other organizations as well as, as the WFEO committee and another, another um, six or seven representatives of other WFEO committees as well. So we had two panel sessions where we spoke about these issues that we've been drawing together around uh, climate change and gender. So what we have been learning, and you know, bear in mind that we're all engineers and we're not social scientists and we don't necessarily know uh, how women are disadvantaged, particularly in the engineering sector. We've been learning this ourselves. So we've been concentrating on these four different areas. So the first one is around women's vulnerability to climate change. The second one is around women and how they are effective actors when they're addressing climate change. The third one is around uh, the engineering that we produce and how to make it more inclusive. And then the fourth one is around capacity building in the engineering sectors. Just to kind of briefly tell you a bit more about those four different areas. So women's vulnerability to climate change. And if you've been involved at all in this CSW um, meeting over this last week or in any of the previous years, you'll know this better than I do, I'm sure. But um, there's a lot of evidence to show how women are more vulnerable to climate change um, than, than men often are. And that's because of reasons like this, they're less able to adapt to climate change uh, activity. They can't move for work, for example, so they stay at home with their families. They're more likely to have their food security disrupted, partly because of that reason that they're not able to travel to, to get food, but also because of changes to biodiversity, which mean they've, means they've got to go further for fuel, um, for water, which means that they don't know how and when to harvest their crops or you know enough about the the, the weather conditions because they don't have access to the to technology or to information often they're more vulnerable to climate migration they've often got children with them as you can see in the picture they don't have a, a digital identity often so it means that they they don't own land and they can't get any funding that is on offer to uh, help them with climate change 
if there are any uh, health or sanitation issues brought about by climate change, then they are the ones that are more likely to be affected. So they'll be looking after their family members and they you know, have that caring responsibility. And you know, any type of disruption leaves them more vulnerable to any type of gender-based violence. So they're the areas where they're more vulnerable to climate change. And obviously we need to know this in engineering and technology, because if we're creating solutions, then we need to know how our solutions are addressing this sort of issue. In terms of women as effective actors, this is all around women having particular roles in different parts of the world, in different societies, and how those roles bring with them different uh, historical and unique understandings of the, their surrounding areas, of the, the, the climate that they live in, and of the kind of biodiversity in their area. And then greater inclusion of these communities reinforces the and validates the significance of that knowledge that they've got. They're also gatekeepers in the home, as you know, you probably know, they are in charge of often purchasing decisions, um, decisions on heating the home, uh, finance, resource collection, cooking, you know, they are the ones that control a lot of these areas in the home. So they're very um, influential and they're also influential as educators as well. And they reinvest a lot of their money into their families. So these are ways that they are effective actors. And if we're looking at climate change solutions, then we need to understand very clearly how women behave and how we can sometimes nudge those behaviors in the right direction. When it comes to technology itself, so I said before, this is the third area. When we're looking at new technology, either replacing the existing technology or creating new uh, behavior changes, then we need to understand really clearly how people access that technology. Not women or, you know, obviously one group of people, but all sorts of people access technology in different ways. And technology can often uh, exacerbate biases if we're not really careful. So we have to make sure that we're, we're aware of that, how we can sometimes be building these biases into our technology. And this is the work that I do actually at Aston University. I work on inclusive engineering and inclusive design. And this is defined as ensuring that our engineering products and services are accessible and inclusive of all users, free as possible from discrimination and bias. And, you know, we can also with engineering, we can reverse some of these historical biases that we've that we have now and that we've um, embedded if you like in the past so if you want to know any more about that I've put some of the websites up there that I work on so, and then finally this women's role in creating climate change solutions so women getting more women and more diversity into these sectors working in engineering we know a lot of interventions already take place to address this one of the things we're particularly working on is the, the United, the UN Women's Action Coalition and the, the Action Coalition programme. I think there are five different action coalitions and we have become commitment makers for one of those action coalitions. And it's called Technology and Innovation for Gender Equality. And what, we're, what we've committed to with that Action co Coalition is that we will use the power of our membership organisation so we will try to drive this change amongst these different organizations around the world. And to do that, we've developed a charter, it's called the Egality Charter. And we're hoping that our institutions will sign up to this charter and then we can lead them on a journey of change. Another way that we have is using this um, scorecard that we've called the Gender Equality Scorecard. And in fact, Jeanette, at Engineers Canada can tell us more about that if you're interested. And this is a way of ensuring that we are getting those gender disaggregated statistics that we can then compile. If you remember, I said before, that was one of our themes within the Women in Engineering Committee. We're trying to build networks. We're trying to mentor the next generation. We've got a program that we want to encourage more entrepreneurs. And we just generally want our engineering sector to become more aware of this the gender perspective in the engineering that we create. 
So women as entrepreneurs, we've got a program where we're trying to uh, compile examples. And I work at King's College in London as entrepreneur in residence. And it's a, often around um, getting more women and, and engineers in general to be empowered to see themselves as change makers when it comes to the sustainable development goals. And actually, I think sometimes we feel that to, to have an impact on climate change, we need to be working in the energy sector, for example. But you know, we will have to change almost every area of our lives you know, in the future and technology will be absolutely key to that. And I think we, we forget actually that we need to drive, te technology needs to drive us to have those healthier lifestyles, um, better eating, active travel, um, better community engagement. So, you know, there's absolutely loads of areas where entrepreneurs will be able to make a difference. We contributed recently to the Engineering for Sustainable Development report that UNESCO produced, and I'm not going to go through these recommendations you'll be pleased to hear, but they, um, they allowed us to develop our set of messages that we wanted to then take to COP26 with us. And we had these actions for the leaders at COP26. And they were around these five actions. So they were um, funding education for women and girls. They're making sure that girls and have equal opportunities to go into careers like engineering. Mainstreaming gender in all decision-making processes. Increasing the structural enablers for equality. So making sure that we have this digital identity for everyone, parental leave, um, accessible working conditions, gender pay gaps. These are all kind of structural levers that we have. Drive the sustainable and inclusive cultures that we in the countries that we live in, using policy, legislation, procurement, for example. And then making sure that the technology that we are producing is equitable so it leads us to this just transition so they were the um, actions that we took to cop 26 so just in conclusion you know we as engineers we need to have a better understanding of women and the role of women in society so that the solutions that we put in place can be equitable and can help us in that pathway to um, addressing climate change so we're designing solutions with those things in mind and then finding more ways to get a better diversity, more diversity of thought within the engineering sector. So that's my um, overview. So thank you very much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing now and pass back to Jeanette. Thank you very much, Don. Our next speaker is Yvette Ramos. With a background in engineering and 25 years professional experience, starting with the position of project manager in industry with Schlumberger Ascom, to expert in strategic planning and change management, including capacity development for telecom companies and hydrological, meteorological, and climate services at the international level, she has extensive experience on managing teams and projects abroad. Over the last 20 years, Yvette had the chance to work with international teams in the private and public sector, in the business and development environment. She holds the position of expert at the specialized United Nations Agency, the ITU, the International Telecom Union, Development Bureau, and the World Meteorological Organization, both with headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. From 2018 to 2021, Yvette was project manager in the World Bank project for the modernization of the Department of Meteorology and Hydrology of the Union of Myanmar. Yvette is the managing director of an international property law firm based in Geneva. She is the first woman president of the more than 100 year old Swiss Engineering Geneva chapter and founder and president of Woman Vai, an international NGO a platform for innovative projects in environment and high tech led by women and supported by all genders. Over to you, Yvette. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, can you see my screen or not? Yes, perfectly. Thank you, Yvette. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dawn, for this uh, very good introduction. Actually, uh, I'm uh, also a member of the WFU. I've been working with the WFU at the really start of that uh, wonderful team of the Women in Engineering Committee back in 2007. 
when we had the first conference for women engineers ever in the world uh, in Tunis uh, under the presidency of Kamel Ayadi from Tunisia. In fact, um, can you see if I scroll down this or not? Please tell me. Um, I did see that your slide has changed a bit. Okay, thank you very much. That's Thanks. what I wanted to say. So myself, I've been involved with the COP uh, UNFCCC uh, process since 2009, my first COP back in uh, uh, COP15 in Copenhagen. And since then, we, uh, we found out, myself and many of my friends and colleagues who wanted to have more engagement in the uh, so civil society um, scope, uh, trying to boost the negotiations there. And what we did uh, four years ago now is to set up an NGO internationally uh, uh, covering and, uh, all countries, if possible, focusing on LDCs, least developed countries. And, and I'll come back to Women by what we do exactly. What I want to say is that we started four years ago this great adventure with uh, uh, 19 uh, co-founding members, friends, colleagues, uh, who of course have our own profession. We work uh, in technology, in environment and uh, internationally or not. And we found out that it was very interesting to have that voice uh, at uh, UNFCC. And uh, proudly I must say that uh, Women Vi got accredited to, to go to Glasgow last year. Uh, and we had like uh, six, uh, a quota of six per week, and we were like 12 people, six on the first week and six on the second week, uh, coming from many countries, Brazil, France, Switzerland, uh, Africa, also Cameroon, etc. So uh, we, we did start uh, some time ago the process of building that uh, woman value, and I must say that from what you uh, mentioned, uh, Dofield, uh, Dofield from the uh, what you do, what we do at WE Committee is very much complementary to what uh, we actually propose at Women Vibe because uh, on one hand, we have similar objectives like uh, fighting for climate change and uh, trying to build solutions for adaptation, uh, working together on equality education because we believe that uh, uh, the highest uh, education you have, the best uh, you will be uh, fighting in life and for the, not only for yourself, but also for the others towards more uh, social justice, et cetera. And also we develop projects aligned with the uh, agenda of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, where, which were voted at the 2015 General Assembly uh, in uh, New York of the UN. Uh, Women Vi, so you've got the SDGs right in front, and this is a panel of all that we did for the past three years. With COVID, it has been, uh, on one hand, very <laughs> difficult, of course, for many of us, from many point of views, but it has also helped develop those online tools that we profit, by the way, we benefit from uh, today. So we are now experts in uh, developing those. And uh, what I want to say here is that we had a great opportunity of gathering together many people around the table on those specific topics that are basically what are the high tech solutions to uh, work for climate change adaptation. And this is really what we want to aim at and bring to the table of negotiators uh, to the COP27 in uh, Egypt uh, before the end of the year. What we do at Women Vi is basically we work all along the process from the youngest to the, the oldest. And my experience with Swiss Engineering Geneva is also based on that. So we are local organizations, as Dawn said, that the BLEFU uh, brings all these networks uh, together at the international level. But we really, at the local level, we already provide a lot of uh, content. Uh, for the youngest girls and boys, for the, the, the ladies who, who need to build their self-confidence and also for women entrepreneurs uh, around the world. How we do that? Uh, we have developed uh, uh, different tools for kids. So to uh, raise their uh, consciousness uh, uh, and raise their level in STEM, science, engineering, technology, and maths, uh, we have... Um, uh, workshops for girls and boys, but we really focus on the girls uh, uh, the target because also because we are women, 
when we facilitate those workshops, all of a sudden boys and girls also realize that mixity brings wonderful things when we work together in teams. So we've got many kits and uh, we've uh, been awarded a few um, budget, especially in Geneva, uh, where we provide uh, classes, primary classes with uh, STEM tools to help them uh, see that STEM, uh, engaging in STEM is also something that is not so far away from what they want to do. Uh, the Women by Academy started, and here the target is more on the women aged above uh, 18, 1820. It started uh, two years ago with uh, the first country we went to under the uh, auspice of uh, Ministry of Digital Affairs in uh, Benin, Kotonou. Of course, it's a LDC, so we went there, the four of us uh, co-founders, and we delivered the workshop aimed at uh, helping those ladies to speak and pitch and develop their business plan uh, that are, are bringing, again, uh, is uh, around technical issues for climate change adaptation. So it can be in many socioeconomic sectors like agriculture, cosmetics, uh, production of cassava or uh, some uh, type of other type of works, transport, mobility, education but we always help those ladies be able after three intensive uh, days of uh, uh, working together and then presenting their project in a very short time uh, to be able at the end to knock on the door of the finances, potential finances or partners that they need. So when we go from their country, they are equipped with all those managerial and technical tools. So we provided uh, a few sessions last year and the year before, because it was under the COVID, we did it in uh, webinars, but the uh, last one was in Mauritania, in Workshot, uh, capital city with 50 women who had again, fantastic projects. And uh, next, uh, this year, we plan to do it in Tunisia in June, Senegal and Benin again in October, November, uh, just before their, um, uh, what they call the Semaine du Numérique, the week of digital. Uh, okay, so we have other uh, solutions because as Don mentioned, the women and the, the girls, they are the first really vulnerable uh, category of people around the world when it comes to climate change and the consequences of climate change, including wars, including conflicts and uh, including selection for education, etc. So we have developed a tool with partners, this is more in France, that uh, helps uh, connect and stop the violence, not only at home, but also on your profession, uh, at work and uh, in specific occasions. So this is very technical, I won't go through that. Um, maybe these are more slides for the next questions, but I would like to introduce uh, that uh, some of the people say that maybe COP26 was really last chance uh, for the negotiators, but uh, I'll leave it here for you to think about that question and we'll come back later, I think, during the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvette. Our next speaker is Alice Cuna de Silva. Alice is a nuclear engineer working at Westinghouse, developing business in the Latin American region and managing the entity subsidiary in Brazil. Alice earned her bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. She also has an MBA in project management from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Bordeaux. She is a TEDx speaker, the international organization chair of the International Youth Nuclear Congress 2020, a member of the COP26 nuclear delivery team that targets the inclusion of nuclear energy in the discussion of climate change and on the advisory board for COP27 on that same subject. Alice is also a member of the executive committee of Women in Nuclear Brazil, communication and education chair of the Latin American section of the American Nuclear Society and a member of the Women in Engineering Committee of the World Federation Engineering Organizations. Over to you, Alice. Thank you. 
Um, first of all, good morning, afternoon, good night, good evening to, to everyone uh, attending. And it's a pleasure to be here talking uh, a little bit about that topic, which is very um, important and dear to me. Uh, I will start before entering in my participation at COP26 um, that we are sharing here, just sharing a bit about the scenario of women in engineering in Brazil, where I'm, I'm from. Um, and currently, according to CONFEA, which is the uh, uh, organization that registers the different types of engineers in Brazil and, and has uh, leadership on the on the professional organizations uh, of engineering in each state of Brazil, uh, reported, uh, the most recent report uh, shows that only 19% of the active engineers in their system are women. And here I brought uh, to show some of the um, per state different levels of professionals and, and, and how many of them are women and how many of them are men. Um, and in this picture here of Brazil with the percentages, um, it is the percent of women in engineering organization council uh, in the, the, the councils that each of those states have for the professional engineering organizations. And as you can see, um, one, per, one state has a big percentage, but all the others um, follow the trend of less than 20% with several below even 10% of women. So women participation in engineering in Brazil is something that it still needs a lot of work. Um, in comparison to many other countries, we are worse uh, in the, in the uh, situation that we are in, in motivating women to pursue careers in engineering. Um, but also uh, these are the women in professional organizations. And we are what we notice is the tendency of a larger number registered, but the ones that stay in the profession uh, are much, much smaller. So we, we are trying to evaluate this situation of women leaving, uh, like the leak pipe that has a research at UNESCO for academia. It is something very important for us to understand also uh, what is driving women out of the engineering workforce which is happening a lot in Brazil. And as you know, not only in Brazil, but here in particular, I brought the Brazil date. Uh, so when we talk about bringing in more women in engineering, we also talk about how to make them stay, how to motivate them to stay, how create environments that allow those women to continue pursuing growth in, the, in, in this career, because we bringing in a uh, uh, new, new people to the field uh, is essential, but also having an environment that allow them to stray growing and go into leadership uh, is, is essential for solutions of problems like climate change that, that we are talking because we need the, those women to be in the leadership positions of making those decisions as well. And when we talk about engineering, I always like to bring this perspective of what is engineering? Uh, when I was in college and we were, I was studying nuclear engineering and trying to, to understand the different, in the beginning, the different calculus and physics and all these topics um, that they'll, they'll, we started in this career, uh, what was driving the motivation of uh, staying that in an environment that was not friendly for me being one uh, in, a, in a class of only men uh, very often, uh, it was the definition that engineering is uh, so to solve problems. We are as in engineers uh, are here, are to, we are trained to solve problems using science and mathematics and, 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 and scientific discoveries and trying to apply into protocols use. And when we talk about climate change and we talk about gender gap, those are global problems, those are global issues. And, and I think that's at least my personal perspective that we are trained and to solve big issues. And then this is a chicken and egg situation of um, we need to solve gender gap and we need 
to bring women to support solving this gender gap as well. Um, and when I think about gender gap and the solutions, and I think we also need to see not only as how can we address this gender issue, but how, how can we address, address all issues that we have embedding gender in the center of, of uh, the solutions. And that is something that we see in the SDGs, right? Gender is not something that it is one separate issue that we need to solve. That's what Don uh, just spoke, but Yvette spoke as well, is embedded in the different challenges that we have as a global community. Uh, we have challenges in energy, we have challenges in water, we have challenges in many, many areas, and gender cannot be separate from those challenges. The gender gap and solving that issue uh, needs to be at the center, it needs to be embedded in the, in the solutions of each of those challenges. And that is something that we, as a young generation uh, part, that I was part of COP26, try to brought into the organization of the activities that we had for COP26. You was, uh, we were discussing energy we were talking about a diversity of solutions in energy. We were trying to bring to the discussion the collaboration of different energy sources. Um, and we wanted to make sure that in those discussions of energy and energy solutions, we were making sure that women and gender issues were at the center, uh, even though maybe we were not specifically discussing uh, uh, women difficulties and, and, and the worst consequences that they face it with climate change, uh, we embedded that issue in everything that we did uh, because we knew that without that diversity, our discussion in energy, you wouldn't make sense uh, because we were not bringing in the diversity of problems that women across the world in different regions face. So talking a bit about what we did there, just to share experience of how we, how we included that. We, YGN is Young Generation Network. And we were at COP26 with this vision to have a clean, sustainable and abundant carbon-free future uh, 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 for all. And our mission was to try to accelerate the ability of getting there with the net zero by 2050, by driving collaboration of the different clean energy sources that include nuclear and renewable technology. And we were discussing the IPCC reports that showed exactly that same, uh, um, the same mindset that we need this collaboration. We were talking with the International Energy Agency that issued roadmap to net zero uh, solutions with the same uh, instructions of leveraging all the low carbon footprint uh, sources that include nuclear and renewables. And, and the way we were addressing that was making sure we had diversity embedded in our areas. We had more than 70 volunteers uh, from all, all over the world, uh, from all different continents, from Asia from to Africa, Latin America, uh, North America, all, not all countries of Europe, but a, a large portion of Europe, especially because the COP26 was there. So it was easier for people to attend. And we wanted diversity of backgrounds. We wanted diversity of uh, um, experiences and diversity of uh, issues that people were living and we wanted to bring that to the table when we were discussing that, that solution. And the way we addressed that was since the beginning when we were thinking of getting together as a volunteering youth community, we made sure that diversity was there um, and that we had, uh, we had 51, 49 percentage of men and women in our group. We had uh, we had people from all, all over the world making sure they were sharing the, the consequences of climate change in their region so we could address that in everything that we were discussing and making sure we were talking to people with that in mind. Uh, we were uh, putting women at the front of the discussion. And our message was 
of collaboration. It was a collaboration not only uh, between uh, renewables and nuclear, as we were discussing, but a collaboration of different organizations. So we got in touch with women's organizations, women in nuclear, as I'm part of, as, as uh, Jeanette uh, said, but also other organizations with could be seen as different goals. Um, but we knew that we were there together to find a solution for this global problem. So we were not trying to uh, discuss uh, uh, what is better in, in terms of uh, my solution is better than this solution. We were trying to find a common ground because getting together and finding this common ground was essential to make sure we found a, a true solution to everyone, an inclusive solution to everyone, a solution that doesn't include half of the world's population is not a solution. So this was, was our key message during that, was having diversity embedded in everything and understanding that together is better, that going together is better in all levels. Um, we organized for COP26 and we have the advantage and, and I, I air quote advantage of having more time because last uh, 2020 didn't have COP so we had more than one year uh, uh, to organize our, and it was all volunteers so we were all doing this um, on our free time to try to engage policymakers, the media, uh, uh, NGOs, uh, trying to use social media outreach, uh, putting um, a paper, a position paper to show our uh, our position while we were looking for to, the, to say to the policymakers so people could co reference and put the papers and the academia references and everything that people could go and read. And again, as I said, putting diversity and gender uh, at the center of everything we did. And in, during COP, our activities uh, were, as I said, putting women at, at the center. So we had an activity and actions on gender day, uh, as you can see the, the picture in the center are all women volunteers that were there. Uh, we, were, we, we were able to talk to the media and our, um, chemical uh, engineer expert, they were there, uh, a, a young woman, she was speaking to them. I was able to meet AOC. Uh, we were involved in the, in the youth led protests with our message and bringing in uh, women as well. We were, we, we were able to meet with uh, the, the leadership of the UK scout and, and talk with him as well and then uh, as well with the UK uh, science advisor uh, during COP26, we were able to talk with, uh, we made such a movement that we were able to get an interview with Wall Street Journal and over the phone. Uh, and our message was translated there and one of, with, of our youth advocates, they were there, um, was referencing his article about the message that we were trying to promote. But we organized in a way that women had the leadership, were 50-50 in the leadership of this campaign, of this volunteering campaign, uh, and that this was addressed in everything that we did and all the messages that we were sending. And just here, uh, uh, a picture of us, uh, uh, the leadership team in COP. But again, just to emphasize what we, learned there, and that was my first COP, and I'll talk more in the questions about it. But what we learned there is we didn't want to isolate the, the, the issue that we were mainly seeing as uh, we, you came to discuss this. We wanted to make sure to show the cross-section and, and how everything go together. And if we separate things, and if we are not collaborating with the different organizations, there is no actual solution. Um, and that was what we put in the center of everything, diversity, collaboration. Um, so we have actually a fair, just climate change solution. Thank you. Stop sharing, sorry. Oh, thank you so much, Alice. 
Our final speaker is Alba Sare Perez Tehran. Alba is a climate change policy advisor with Oxfam Belgium and is part of the working group on gender and climate within the Consultative Council for Gender and Development in Belgium. The Gender and Development Advisory Council, also known as the CCGD, was created by royal decree in Belgium to contribute to the decisions of the Belgian Minister for Development Cooperation and the federal government of Belgium in matters of gender and development. Through its role as advisor, it contributes to a better consideration of gender in Belgian cooperation policy. It also makes proposals to feed the work of international bodies, including in the context of preparing Belgium's position in these bodies. The CCGD brings together the expertise of the academic world, women's councils, NGOs, and the Institute for the Equality of Women and Men, both on the French-speaking and Dutch-speaking sides. Alba has more than a decade of experience in climate policies. She has two master's degrees in environmental sciences and gender studies, and has worked in several countries in Africa, Asia, and Europe with NGOs and research centers. She is currently focusing on the integration of gender into climate policies and the respect of human rights of Belgian energy policies. Over to you, Alba. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, and I'm so happy this conversation is, is happening. Um, as we have seen in the other presentations, this keeps being uh, an issue um, over the years, um, even though it hasn't been shown for, for a long time. Um, what I'm going to present today um, are the results of our research that we did through uh, the Council on Gender and Development in Belgium on the National and Energy Plan um, of Belgium. Um, and just a bit of a context before that, um, I mean, a lot of the data have already been uh, mentioned and, and, and you know, but just to, to remind some of the issues why, as you have said, this is not just a technological problem, but it's a social problem. Um, women are more, I, I like to say marginalized, not vulnerable, because they are not vulnerable in, in essence, we are not. It's, it, it's a problem uh, of how society is organized and how we are raised. Um, we lack resources. Uh, only 10% of the land worldwide um, is managed by, by women, and most of the people in poverty are, are, are women. Um, and we see a lot of impacts um, in being suffered by women because of these, but also uh, because climate change has impact on livelihood, food security, migration, and peace, uh, and security. Um, and women are also also marginalized in these um, areas. They are most of the victims in natural disasters, and they are also um, most of the civilian victims in, in armed conflict. Um, and however, only 12% uh, 12, 12 of the ministers, environmental ministers worldwide are women, so we are not able to take decisions. In the parliament, um, the, the, the share is a bit higher, but still very low. It's around 24% um, uh, two years ago. Um, so we do have a big issue to, to, to tackle. Um, and also important to mention that we cannot consider women as a, just as a, as a single group. We, we have different angles uh, of uh, oppression. Um, there is age, race, there is also obviously nationality, um, handicap, sexual orientations, many things that we need to take into account and that are more and more being considered um, also in policy making. Um, last year at the COP, um, one of the reports also considered intersectionality in, uh, in their analysis of women's participation, um, luckily. Um, as I said, we have been talking about gender integration into climate policies for a long time. It was included in the Rio Declaration, um, and it was uh, it, in the Beijing platform was also one of the, the things that was considered. Unlikely, from the conventions that came out from the Rio uh, declarations, uh, the one on, um, on climate did not consider gender at the beginning. Um, it was only 10 years later that we started including it and it was very soft and, and up until today uh, it is still a struggle because 
as uh, some of you have mentioned, we keep thinking of the climate crisis as something that, that has to be solved on its own, and we don't see the connections um, with, with the social problems um, that are embedded as well. Um, in Europe, luckily, um, it's been more and more considered in the legislative um, framework um, that um, frames the, the, the national plans. It was also included in the uh, NDC, which I think all of you know, but just to, to make sure, um, is a document that countries have to submit to the uh, UNCCC with their commitments. Um, but it, it's still yet only a political declaration uh, internationally. But then when we go to the legal instruments at the European level and at the Belgian level, we see it lacking. Uh, the European Green Deal is uh, gender blind. And as you will see, also the, um, the Belgian plan is mostly gender blind. Um, only to say that this, this has been improving. Uh, now 80% of the NDCs are making references to gender, but they're still very general. They just say that they want to do it, but they don't say how. Um, there are no mention in any of the NDCs worldwide to the link between gender and mitigation. And as you know, we cannot solve the climate crisis through adaptation measures. We need to reduce the emissions. And, and so this is, this is a big issue that we need to tackle. Uh, if we want to keep moving forward. What we saw in the, um, in the Belgian um, uh, plan um, is that there was, there, there was a good debate on the agri, right? Um, it was considered in one of the parts uh, of the plan. Uh, Belgium is a complex country, even though it's very small. So one of the regions did consider it uh, in terms of uh, um, energy poverty, but also in terms of how uh, the national climate policies in Belgium would have impacts in the, in the global south. But besides that, um, the rest of, of, the, of the plan was, was empty, um, and we hope we will be able to, to tackle that in the coming years because it needs to be updated. Um, some of the negative effects that we saw from the, from the plan um, is that our, our plan and a lot of the plans in, in Europe, and I would say in the, um, in the Western uh, countries or the industrialized countries, they rely a lot on mineral extractions for the um, um, renewable energies. We have to extract up, up to 23 different minerals. And most of the, these minerals are coming from the global south. Uh, they come from countries such as um, uh, DRC, uh, Rwanda, and, and other countries in, in Central Africa. And this extraction has impacts. Um, we see malformations um, on kids that are born from pregnant women living in the surrounding area. Um, it is, even though it is forbidden for these women to legally work in these mineral um, extraction areas by, by law, by the uh, Congolese law, they still do it informally. So they are, they, they have these double, double threads of not being legally protected. Um, but of course, you know, this, this is all the issue with uh, feminization of poverty. They need to have an access to, to income. And so they, they still go to, to these areas. Um, there's also a high reliance on biofuel in a lot of European countries. Um, besides Denmark, which decided to, to uh, uh, phase out biofuels, I think it was uh, last week, first generation biofuels. Um, and as you know, uh, first generation biofuels, so the, the ones that are being done from um, agricultural um, matter that can also be used for food, they are a strong push for land grabbing. And because women, as I mentioned at the beginning, are not... They, they don't have the control of land. They are much more uh, at the risk uh, of this land grabbing. There are also issues of sexual harassment in biofuel plantations and, and intimidation. Um, and also the type of jobs that people get in these plantations many times are not in, in good conditions. Um, and they don't have the proper income. Um, we also see a gap in the uh, renewable energy sector in the green jobs. Only 24% of the of the jobs are held uh, by women. And and also we see the other side of the coin that a lot of the jobs that men are men are having are also really carbon intensive. And we we are not yet aiming to to tackle that. A lot of times we speak about women, but we don't speak about men in the 
in the picture. I see I only have one minute. I'll try to go fast through the recommendations uh, of this study, uh, but I'll try to share the link so that you can read it. We have a whole report on the website. Um, some of the recommendations, as you know, is increasing participation so that we can um, improve the way these policies are done, but also in the enterprises uh, to correct the policies that they have to increase the financing. Um, only 1.5% of global climate finance um, is actually tackling gender. Um, uh, and this is a big gap taking into account that we are half of the humanity. Um, and so this is something that we need to correct, hopefully from before the next COP uh, with the new commitments that have to be done. We need a lot of, um, of data collection uh, because a lot of times the, the problem is not well analyzed uh, because we don't we don't have the information. Um, we also need to tackle these through tackling poverty, right? It's not only correcting the climate policies, the energy policies, but also all the um, all the, the, the background problems that are there so that uh, women can also um, find uh, their own solutions. We need to invest in, in, in social protection as well, uh, invest more in sustainable um, agriculture and uh, a different type of economy that in which uh, women can rely as well. Um, in terms of the, the green economy, we need to uh, keep training people to fight the stereotypes, some of which you have mentioned as well, um, so that women have more access to engineering positions as well, um, but also the way decisions are being um, made. And also it's it's very important to have a human rights based approach. We It's not only because including women in the energy transition is going to be something good for the society that we need to do it. It's also because it's our own rights as a human being to participate in this and to reduce the, um, the effects of uh, climate change. Um, and the last two set of recommendations is really to have this intersectional approach to adapt it to all the different type of problematics that are there. Um, women of color are not going to have the same issues as, as white women. Sometimes they might be living in uh, poorer neighborhoods where the, the temperatures are higher or the, the working conditions are, are worse. Um, in different countries, the, 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 the tissue, the agricultural tissue, the economic tissue is different. And we also need to speak about masculinity. And this is really lacking a lot. Just to give you an example, in this report that I was mentioning um, from the COP26, the intersectional analysis was done for women, but not for men. So it was very difficult to know if those men in power were um, from which countries, from which economic background, uh, and, and from which economic sector. We, we also need to, to tackle that so that we can approach the problem from different angles. Janet, over to you. Thank you so much, Alba. Now we have some questions that we'd like to direct to specific panelists, and we're going to start with Yvette. Yvette, you have gone to a series of COPs over the past 10 years. Have you seen an evolution? And if so, what kind of evolution has this been? Yes, I've seen an evolution, obviously, because uh, since 10 years, I hope that uh, with all those negotiations at higher level, uh, we have an evolution and positive evolution. Otherwise, we just have to stop going to those cops, right? So do you have my, sh my screen sharing now? Yes, I can see your yes, slides. Just the two, three slides, because uh, of course, one major, uh, as it was uh, recalled by the, the previous uh, speakers, uh, we understand that since the Earth Summit who took place in 92, uh, Brazil, uh, we had a series of COP with the first COP in Germany uh, and, and then every year basically uh, trying to negotiate. At first, we didn't have at all the NGOs and the civil society and the media even uh, involved. Basically, it was just uh, the governance uh, trying to uh, uh, negotiate. And of course, all of those lobbies coming from the you know carbon uh, sectors and the industries, etc. So... Obviously, we've gone through a strong evolution. I would like just to recall the Accord de Paris that took place since COP21. And even though it is not a perfect 
uh, agreement, we must understand that there has been some um, some uh, evolution and positive uh, evolution. The latest IPCC report uh, dated, actually there's a new one, 2022 February, but this one, uh, the one of last year, already mentions that there are strong things that we can do, uh, increase the efforts to build resilience on climate change and reduce the uh, gas uh, emissions and provide necessarily financing for both. And financing is something that was just recalled. We need finance to adapt. And there was something also interesting that uh, was uh, very much discussed this year, I mean, in Glasgow, is about the adaptation. Because all of the efforts until now, or roughly until now, were put under mitigation. But we really need to have a strong financing on the adaptation. And I would like to recall that there are these two uh, major uh, perspectives that we need to act on in parallel. Uh, just a, a re reminder that, uh, yes, there were a lot of uh, people at the last COP and uh, nearly 1,600 NGOs from all around the world and a lot of media also. And the latest IPCC report, and I'll end to that, uh, saying that uh, there is still, and this is more for the future, there is still some uh, progress to, that we can make. And the progress is really on what Everything that we discussed now is being part of the civil society major groups. Women VI is part of the women constituency, and we do a lot of lobby from the women uh, perspective. So we need to act not only on spot, by the way, but also pre all along the year, working with the national UNFCC focal point in your countries. And really, this is something that uh, uh, we have to do and prepare better for the COP27. So, uh, get the accreditation if you are an NGO and uh, go there and also structure uh, what you want to do because it's uh, very complex when you arrive there and maybe we'll have the, the chance to discuss again. So sorry, I I'll just finish here and I'll come back if there is more question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yvette. Our next question is for Dawn. Dawn, I understand that COP26 in 2021 was your first COP. What were your impressions and what surprised you most about the event? Yeah, gosh. Um, yeah, so I'm a real newcomer to COP, unlike uh, Yvette, who's been there many, many times before. And I, I think this time probably I got involved because it was in the UK and I'm from the UK and it was you know, easy for me to go up there, whereas normally I guess I wouldn't uh, attend COP. And so it was quite interesting actually to see that for the first time and I hadn't I, I think I had a very different opinion of what what it would be like and I the thing that surprised me most I think was that there wasn't more it was very political and financial and there weren't more engineering solutions kind of on display and and in the um I can't remember the colour of the zone the blue zone I think it is but not the public zone which I think was the green zone but in the blue zone it was an enormous sight and it's pretty overwhelming when you get there and there's so much to see so many presentations I mean it's a really great source of of learning if you like but but the thing that did surprise me was that on the stands where you went around the different exhibitions there weren't more ways of kind of visible ways of turning that policy and those commitments into into action and into kind of engineering speak types of action um, so I think that was what probably surprised me most from from COP26. I, I you know, I, I've not really been involved in the whole conversation. You know, I, my, I'm a materials engineer by background. Um, and I think, you know, there is a lot of learning to be done, but I think that we can't let that put people off getting involved. And I think you know, despite the complexity of it all, there, you don't have to have been involved in the climate science for the last 10 years. You just have to now start to be paying attention and to think about how this is applying to us as individuals. So, yeah, I was really, I'm really kind of, you know, it would have been nice to be in, have been involved 10 years ago, but I'm happy that I'm a pretty newcomer to the whole seen if you like and I think lots of us are and I think if we can take people on that journey and not feel that they 
should have been involved before I think that will help all of us and help people to feel empowered that they can actually get involved and make a difference so they were my impressions well thank you so much Don. so we're going to go over to Alba next with two questions and Alba the first of these is Based on your experience in Belgium, how are technological responses to the climate crisis integrating or not integrating gender justice? Thanks, Janet. Well, um, that's the problem, right? We, we are seeing that they are not integrating it. I think this is not a surprise for anybody. What is interesting to see is that when you analyze the different policies from different countries, um, countries from the global south we, it's not a term that i enjoy a lot but just for for shortness um countries that have received um development aid for a long time they are doing far better in the into the integration of gender in their policies because there has been this push and this focus on how to do it better and so now we have some some very good examples at least in the policies then there is a problem of implementation i completely agree with that um, um but we have some very good examples such as the the marshall islands for example or nepal they have developed their NDCs, they are integrating gender into specific ways. Gender is transformative, it's not just an add-on, but they want to change the power relationship. But also the way they have done it is through consultation with feminist organizations and women organizations. All the countries should do that. And countries, industrialized countries, um, they, they are not doing that because they think we think everything is fine you know we we have the industry we we have a high economic income and and that's all that matters but in social terms there is a problem and the problem also is not only for women living in these countries but also because the policies that we have in the north they have very bad impacts in other countries that we are not looking at and and we also need to tackle that Thanks, Alba. And our next question for you is, what steps is the Belgian Consultative Council on Gender and Development taking to close this gap? Well, um, it's, a, it's a long trajectory, um, I would say, that it, it's really adapted to, to the context. And this is very important, uh, that there is no one solution fits all. Uh, every country has to take their own strategy and see how it, it's going to be best fit. We were lucky in Belgium to have the, the Consultative Council. There are other councils attached to other ministers. And so we are working through the existing structure to improve things. Um, first of all, there was the creation of the working group on gender and climate to be able to speak about that. And this is something that is missing in other countries because people working on climate policies, they think, oh no, this is a social issue. The gender people will speak about that. And then the equality ministers or the women ministers or whatever we call them in, in, in different countries, they say, oh, that's an environmental problem. We don't need to talk about that. So some, many times there is not a single space to talk about the intersection of those. So we created that group. Um, and we started doing, trying to provide data. We, we analyzed the, the National uh, Climate and Energy Plan that I have uh, presented, um, and, and we provided some recommendations. And now we are trying to work through the existing structure to, to improve that, um, trying to share this information that we have also at the political level, doing some, some training, some, some webinars, and also encourage the Belgian government to have a national gender and climate focal point as it is mandated by the UNCCC, because there is no one in Belgium, um, at least half of the signatories of the Paris Agreement don't have a, a focal point. Uh, and, and this is the same thing, as I was saying, we needed this group to speak about that. We also need someone in the government and the administration to have a mandate to solve this problem and to be a connection with the engineering organization, with the civil society, with the universities, because otherwise nobody feels responsible for that. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Alice. Alice, like Dawn, COP26 was also your first COP and you were part of a youth community focused on collaboration about different energy sources. What were your impressions of COP, more particularly about the involvement of youth? Uh, so I had, uh, 
But as my first COP, I was impressed with uh, many things uh, and trying to evaluate from uh, a sense of not being too uh, dazzled by the, the being there for the first time on that level of conversation uh, and trying to see and address the issues. And, and what I notice um, from that youth perspective is um, that Youth is no longer, uh, and, and I can say for myself as well, is, is no longer accepting the term of being leaders of tomorrow. Um, we are leaders of today already. Youth wants to take charge already because it is a lot of talk and less action um, um, and, and less implementation as uh, Dunn done pointed out so on her perspective. There was a lot of discussions and the action plans of how that discussion would be actually implemented, it was something that it was lacking from, from what we were seeing. Um, my other impression was that although we had uh, uh, gender days and, and the focus on gender equality in there, simple things uh, were not um, addressed and were not even uh, thought on the planning. One thing that happened with my youth community over there is uh, we needed women hygiene products and they were just not available inside COP. And then like if you went to the restaurants and trying to buy a tampon, for example, like on the machine, that was not that was not available in the huge space of that conference. And we had people from Glasgow that over there in our group that said like, this is law in Glasgow, this needs to be uh, available in the restaurant for, of women. And we, we went to complain, we were looking for it. And it was a point fingers, oh, this event is a UN event, UN had to be worried about that. And then the UN, oh, this event is uh, uh, in the city of Glasgow, they should have uh, look for that. And in the end, women were the ones that didn't have access to what they need. And it was just a simple things that we know that is obvious and an event of that, that size with almost 200 countries over there discussing solutions that include gender ecology and they didn't even think that women over there would need those sort of things. So um, this was, it was, we, we had advanced in discussions, but then these small things shows how much we still need to, to go forward, we still need to change, still need to be there. Um, and another thing that we were noticing was suddenly in the gender day, there was much more women speakers. <laughs> uh, and and it was gender was in the same day as science and innovation. And we were wondering where those women were in the discussions in the other days. They shouldn't be here just for the gender day. They shouldn't be here just to speak on the gender issues. They need to be involved in everything else uh, as the solution without them will not be a solution. Um, so this intersection that I was trying, I was trying to, to speak on my presentation that we were trying to do in our group was not only have women for speaking on gender issues, but having the women professional sharing perspectives on, all, on everything and being embedded in this. So we noticed those things and I noticed those things. Of course, I was very uh, um, happy to be there and for the first time being part of that discussion. Um, being able to hear the uh, the negotiations and and learn from others and uh, open my eyes on issues of locations that I was not familiar with um, and and try to to share also that aspect of collaboration that we were trying to bring. Well, Alice, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and perspectives. Speaking about COP and who attended, I wanted to let the audience know that the panelists and I are very curious about if any of you were at COP and we're wondering if you could raise your hand if you were at COP this year or last year. 
Okay, so I don't see any any hands raised. So I'm gathering that only those who uh, among our panelists who are presenting were uh, were at COP. Okay, so that's that's really great to know. The next thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to ensure that all of you among the audience had the opportunity to ask some questions also. So did you have any questions for us? I know that on our end, we did have a few additional questions that we had wanted to share. So I will continue with those questions, but at any point, please feel free to pop your question in the chat or to raise your hand and we're happy to continue to pose questions to the panelists. Okay. I think there's one coming in actually there. You're on mute. Hi, is that you, Xiaoru? You had a question for us? And yes, you are. Your microphone is still off. Yes, it looks like it's on now, if you'd like to test it. Sorry, sorry for that. I'd like to share something and also some questions. Yeah, you know, more and more women in China are receiving higher education. And according to the China Education Statistic Yearbook, in the 70 years from 2004 to 2020, the percentage of female students have steadily increased. For example, undergraduate students from 47 to uh, 54, and master's, master's students from 47 to 52, and uh, PhD, PhD students from 39 to 41. So, so you can see female, female undergraduate students and female master's students exceeds men. However, the percentage of female students in engineering still um, has been lower. It's about 21 for undergraduate students, 28 for master's students, and 21 for PhD students. So the question is that, do you think it is significant to raise the percentage of female students in engineering? We, we are asked by my colleagues and, um, and people say, it is a natural choice. So what is the significance for women in engineering? I'd like to, to hear from you. So are there any of our panelists who would like to start? I see Dawn's hand up. Over to you, Dawn. Yeah, I have that. I think the problem that you've described is one that many, many countries, not all countries, but not all countries in terms of engineering education, but many, many countries in terms of engineering education face all around the world. And, it, you know, it really is crucial to getting more diversity of thought and more inclusion into our technology and into our decision making, that we get more women with the opportunities to choose an engineering subject. And there's all sorts of reasons. You know, there's like a jigsaw puzzle full of different reasons why there, there are barriers to stop them coming into the engineering sector. And, and that will look different in different countries. And I know, you know, we do, we do work to address that. It is nowhere near significant, in my opinion, because we've had this problem for a long time. You know, I, I have been past president of the Women's Engineering Society, and we're a hundred year old organization. So we've been looking at this problem for at least a hundred years, really, getting more women into these, um, into engineering education. But 
you know, we need, we do really need to start making some progress, I think, and being more ambitious in our, in our actions. And, you know, one of the things as part of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, Women in Engineering Committee, one of the things that we were challenged on at our annual general meeting a couple of weeks ago was the fact that we are still pretty much talking to ourselves in those committees and we don't have that buy-in necessarily from the other parts of our organization and you know I was I was looking at our own um, priorities at WFEO for the next until 2030 I think it is and diversity and inclusion isn't mentioned at all equality equity diversity and inclusion not mentioned in those priorities and so we need we really do need to start embedding you know what we're talking about here as a group of group of probably mainly women into those mainstream conversations and you know we we will continue to try and do that but it is crucial because without that diversity of thought and those perspectives in the sectors that are making those decisions we won't get that change it, you know in the UK we we have a variety of problems further down the education pipeline that impact on the number of women that are able to choose engineering um, you know and they range from being cultural to it, you know it just not being the 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 default choice for women to go into those sectors but yeah we do need to start to be a lot more ambitious in my opinion in in what we're doing so, so i oh thank you don i see that uh, aparna has her hand up and alice also and before i turn the floor over to aparna i just wanted to share two of the things that engineers canada is involved in one of the things is related to collaboration on research along with sociologists and others to bring in the knowledge from other areas, other disciplines outside of engineering to better understand what is happening that is keeping women away from uh, an engineering education, for example, but also what is uh, preventing them from staying in the engineering education uh, organization or institution and in their engineering workplaces. And a big thing that they have encountered, and I don't think it's a surprise to any of us, is around the culture. I'll put a link into the site for the organization that we're collaborating with. It's actually a collaboration of many organizations across Canada, as well as organizations in the United States. They have some great work that they're doing, nicely encapsulated into identifying what is the key barrier and how can we work to address it. The other piece that I wanted to share is a success story that has been encountered by some of our higher education institutions who for a long time were struggling to increase the numbers of women in their first year. And we've had a few successes where we now have more than 40% of women in first year engineering in some of our higher education institutions. So again, it's a relatively recent success, but we are seeing change. So with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Aparna. Hello everyone, I'm Aparna here. Thank you, Jamit. Uh, my question was on collaboration. Yeah, because in each and every country, we can see uh, research going on. In India, I can see the rise. There are so many women in tech and R&D. Uh, but the thing is sharing knowledge, having collaboration is a problem. So whatever the knowledge is there, it's restricted to a few groups. It's not shared with everyone. As Alba said, Climate change is not just a social issue, it's for everyone. So uh, you just mentioned it, but yeah, actually, I mean, uh, collaborating, collaboration, and uh, we should have women forum and just not just the two weeks, but I guess uh, all a year around, we can meet knowledge and collaborate. So what's your thought about that? Thank you for your question, Aparna. I'm going to ask if any of the panelists have any thoughts on Aparna's question. I, if I may, Janet, because I think yes, it, please it go all, ahead, Alice. It all comes together with um, what Shauru was speaking and what Don and you and and Aparna. Um, for for me, this is cultural as well. It is. I, I specifically uh, think that this sort of forum shouldn't be uh, um, uh, limited to certain weeks. I agree with you and just for women to participate and we discuss we know the issues it, it, we 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 know what uh, 
like we are looking for, and then nothing is, is promoted if these decisions doesn't come um, to the forums. They are actually making the decisions and implementing the policies and so on. And it is, it is uh, uh, very cultural, I think. Like I can say for Brazil, for example, that is where I'm locating. Uh, it is common when there is a gender discussion, there is a gender there is discussion, but then that's it like how that goes into other things. I've seen organizations in, in engineering field having a gender committee in, inside the organization that has absolutely no power. They basically just present uh, examples of women in the organization that are normally not in the technical jobs. And great, the organization has a gender committee. And what is actually being done in order to change things in the organization? It's not. Um, I believe a lot in affirmative actions because in Brazil, uh, uh, maternity leave is four months, but paternity leave is five days. So uh, how how do you share the workload of a child if everything goes into the responsibility of the women and how that affects the place of women in, in, in the in the workplace? It's tremendous. Employee employers. Um, know that by have women in their payroll at least four months off uh, whenever they decide to to bring in the next generation of people to the world which it's amazing uh, they have that to take into account which they don't have with men so it's much more cost effective for them not having to deal with that um it is it is such uh and, and that's why i i was saying that it's such a lack of actual actions um, and, and such a problem of things stay in a discussion scenario. And, and we need to push for having uh, uh, a city on the table on the decisions and not only come up with, because what I see and I see with youth as well, um, of course, it's much worse with, with women, but it is, okay, you discuss, you propose something and we are gonna see if we are gonna implement something. And that happens a lot here in, in Brazil. And the solutions uh, don't come. And then there is not shared knowledge of what was discussed there because we think within ourselves. Uh, so pushing for a seat on the table and the decision-making, actual decision-making and being part of everything, all the committees, all the, all the discussions uh, for me is, is essential. It, it was what actually gonna promote change. And, and based on what Shari was asking in the beginning that I, I, that I wanted to, to compliment, for me as well, having affirmative actions of including women um, to what Jeanette said, not only bringing in them to the engineering field, but keeping them in um, because we bring in, in young kids by example as well. And if women are not staying in this field, they don't, won't have examples for the next generation to bring in. So it is a snowball of, of things. So um, yeah, making sure we are not only discussing among ourselves, making sure we are pushing to be where the, the decisions are being made um, and not having, uh, and not accepting that organizations are doing an event on women and we speak there and that's great. Um, and, and then when there is the actual event on decision, we are not there. We are just passive participants of those. And, and this happens here a lot in Brazil. This happens a lot in my field. Um, and just not accepting those anymore is something that I believe we need to do is not accepting that this is still happening in 2022. Thank you so much, Alice. I see that we have one more hand up and that's Alba. And then we will do our wrap up after Alba. So over to you. Thank you. Also to, to share my um, my thoughts with uh, a partner on this. Um, I think this year is very important and we should use it wisely. Uh, we have this C CSW that is linking the topics, but then later on in the year, we have the bond session uh, in which the gender action plan uh, of the UNCCC is supposed to be revised. Um, there are calls for submissions going on on how to 
improve that plan. So I would encourage everyone to, to send a submission. There is also um, the call for site events has been opened today and is closing this Friday. So I also encourage everyone to propose another site event so that we can keep this conversation going um, and, and also keep it for the COP26. Uh, but I think it's also important to move this not only, not to keep it only at the international level, but to move it at the national level whichever structures you have in your in your countries um, to have um, uh, yeah to, to have side events and, and meetings and, and and really try to keep repeating the same messages um, over and over um, and perhaps linking it to the question before on on engineering I think it's not it's not only important to have more women in engineering, but also the way we think about the engineering education, the type of curricula that you have has to be changed as well um, to include so that all students, regardless of the gender, they study um, social issues, you know, be gender, race, uh, race, racism, xenophobia, and all of these things also needs to be included because otherwise, yes, we are going to have more women in engineering, but we are very likely to copy paste the same way of thinking and they are going to be reproducing the same thinking and we are going to keep promoting the same model. So I think this is another way to keep on the, the conversation going to, to make these changes. And last but not least, try to make policy changes as well. And I think um, that's why the, the study that I presented is important because that's also how you manage to make the, the, the change structural, to make it into laws and to have also financial resources to make these changes. Thank you very much, Alba. Oh, oh, I'm just wondering if everyone could mute their microphones for the moment. Okay, great. Um, before I wrap up, I'd like to highlight to our audience that in our audience, we have our WFEO Women in Engineering Chair, Yatunda Holloway. Great to see you today, Yatunde. I'd also like to begin by giving a big thanks to our Hello. panelists. Thank you very much. Hello, Yatunde. So good to see you. Hi, Hi, nice to see you all. Well done. Well done. I won't say much. Well done. Thank you. I'd like to also give a big thanks to our panelists, Don Bonfield, Yvette Ramos, Alice Cuna de Silva, and Alba Sare Perez Terran. Your thoughts and perspectives were greatly appreciated. And as we wrap up a great discussion, let's go back to some of the calls to action that were shared by our panelists. First of all, funding education for women and girls, continuing to concentrate efforts and funding on the education of women and girls as championed at the recent Global Education Partnership Conference in London. Second, mainstreaming gender in decision-making, embedding the gender dimension in all decisions, policies, and actions, and measuring and reporting gender disaggregated data including women voices, women's voices in all decision-making activities. Third, increasing structural enablers for equality, pushing further on structural enablers such as digital identity for all, shared parental leave, inclusive and accessible working conditions, gender and ethnicity pay gap reporting, for example, and driving sustainable and inclusive culture, using the power of policy, legislation, and procurement to drive social justice, equality, and inclusion in our communities and technological sectors. And finally, fifth, ensuring inclusive technology, ensure a just technology transition, which is inclusive of everybody. We thank you all for participating in our session today. All the very best and take care. Bye-bye. To you too, Jeanette. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great one. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you so much.